me. Um, I believe that the Heritage Party can and should have a tremendous role shaping our future and I feel honoured to be able to contribute towards that. Now, I've decided to talk about marriage because I believe that a stable, institutionalised man-woman marriage has the capacity to transform and strengthen society. I think we can, through our support for marriage, change society for the better. I believe that marriage is an arena where the personal really is political in an intimate but transformative way. We have control over marriage because it is not dependent on our legal system but precedes it. The desire for some kind of union with a person of the opposite sex symbolised through ritual is a human universal. It is one of the most deeply felt human needs. Our man-made law, until recently, reflected our unwritten and unchanging natural law. And no matter what harm that man-made law tries to inflict on marriage, marriage is something which we can support and strengthen through our relations with friends and family and in our own private lives. There is extensive evidence that marriage benefits married individuals and their children in all sorts of ways. Marriage has been found to be the most significant contributor towards life satisfaction in the UK, second only to health. Health is itself influenced by marriage. Some have suggested the impact is as large as giving up smoking. The beneficial effect of marriage on mental health has been estimated at $100,000 a year for a person. Marriage increases longevity, married couples gain financially, and perhaps most importantly, marriage has significant benefits for the children of married parents who are less likely to suffer um, from the mental health problems which can otherwise cast a long shadow over that child's life. Now, these are the benefits of marriage to the individual, but it is the benefits of marriage to society which I would like to talk about here. Now, before I do this, I want to talk to you a little bit about the findings of J.D. Unwin. J.D. Unwin conducted extremely rigorous research into the relationship between sexual freedom and cultural development in 86 different countries, and in 1934 published his 600-page book, Sex and Culture. What he discovered was that monogamous, one man, one woman marriage affects society in fundamental ways. He found that there was a strict relationship between those societies which practiced absolute monogamy and cultural flourishing in those societies. It turned out that sexual restraint was associated with huge productive cultural energy. The key factor appeared to be prenuptial chastity. A society which practices prenuptial chastity is much more likely to maintain the monogamy essential to cultural flourishing. Once chastity goes, monogamy follows soon after. Mm. Unwin found that sexual constraints always lead to cultural flourishing, whereas sexual freedom always led to the collapse of the culture three generations later. There were no exceptions. Now we can put this theory to the test. Sexual liberation started in our own culture in the 1960s. Unwin estimated a generation to be 33 years. By the middle of the 21st century, if we don't do anything about it, we can expect to be in a state of complete cultural collapse. Perhaps this is something we can reverse. What I want to do here is explore what it could be about monogamous marriage that brings about this cultural flourishing. And there are three areas which I'm going to look at. Marriage and the creation of society, marriage and the creation of fatherhood, and marriage and the creation of identity. Firstly, marriage and the creation of society. One of the features of contemporary society is that it is our own individual feelings, needs and wants 
which are regarded as a legitimate yardstick for how we identify what is right and wrong. Where each man is his own ultimate authority, this will not make for a harmonious life. Marriage, I suggest, is the first step in transcending the individual, and it is this aspect of marriage which makes it the cornerstone of society. Jordan Peterson tells a useful little story. Friends of his were getting married. Part of their particular ritual involved the couple holding a candle above their heads. The symbolism of this was that they were together subordinating themselves into something which was a source of light and illumination and which had authority over them. This was their marriage and the sum was greater than its parts. The Bible tells us that a man leaves his mother and father and is united with his wife and they together become one flesh. They are no longer individuals. Marriage turns them into a greater whole. Thus marriage through a contract, creates a unit which is greater than the individuals involved. Marriage creates a situation where we put another person first. In this way, marriage becomes a building block for the wider society. In some ways, it reminds me of the Hobbesian world, where in order to transcend a constant state of war, men unanimously renounce a portion of their liberty through a process of covenanting with each other. They transfer their power to an elected sovereign who becomes representative of them all. In my version, this elected sovereign is the marriage itself. It is interesting to note that in Unwin's description of the cultural flourishing, which follows absolute monogamy, deism develops. As men and women learn to put another before themselves, society develops, and so does a belief in God. Submitting to marriage compelled us to be focused on the wants and needs of others, firstly through the contractual tie which focused us on the needs of our spouse, and then through the physical tie which focused us on the needs of our children. Submitting to marriage, then children, meant that it was the world, that meant that it was the family and not the individual, which was the ordering principle of the world. We now think that men got the votes before women. Actually, it was the heads of household who had responsibility for looking after and representing their families who got the vote first. Legal systems, systems of inheritance and political representation were arranged to support the family. For the family, men and women subordinated their interests and worked so hard. Now the second thing which only marriage can do is create fatherhood. While of course the biological links would still exist, without marriage, society would be reduced to mother and child units. And fatherhood as we know it, and the family which follows from it, would not. But fatherhood lies not just at the heart of the family. It was the provisioning done by fathers which helped us to, own, to develop into homo sapiens rather than some more simple-minded ape. For example, human juveniles take significantly longer to mature than other primates, and this facilitated the acquisition of language, culture, social cooperation, and numerous skills. The possibility of an extended childhood was ensured by male providing and protecting, which would have created a safer framework for children to take longer to mature. In this way, male protecting and providing helped us to evolve into homo, homo sapiens and is therefore absolutely fundamental to who we are. But why is marriage so essential to fatherhood? Firstly, marriage binds a man to a woman and it is only through this formalized link with a woman that fatherhood in its fullness can occur. This is because of the primacy of the mother-child bond. For example, the social scientist Andrea Doucette researched stay-at-home dads in Canada and was struck by the extent to which even among this group of fathers there, were there was a belief in the primacy of the mother-infant bond. Jeff Dench explains how you cannot easily determine who a father is until you have identified the mother. And unless a mother renounces all ties with a child, then fatherhood is mediated by motherhood. 
Nicholas Townsend carried out detailed ethnographic work into marriage, work, and fatherhood in the US and showed how this mediation occurred. For all the married men he interviewed, their dreams and plans for fatherhood depended on the cooperation of women who made possible the biological and social reproduction which lay at his heart. Townsend also found that marriage tended to speak, sorry, Townsend also found that men tended to speak much more in the gender neutral terms of parent when discussing their fathering role. What the word parent obscured was that it was actually the mothers who did most of the hands-on work. It was also the mothers who acted as the default parent, organizing and enforcing the children's activities. Even when it came to the traditional paternal role of disciplining the children, the mothers were the gatekeepers and mediators of how this would be done. Thus, if the parents split up the father's relationship with children can be severely attenuated or even ended. That mothers are the gatekeepers is confirmed through plentiful research. Marriage also creates the roles and responsibilities which sustain fatherhood. It is the institution of marriage which encourages men to take on the obligations of provisioning and providing. Married men accept an enduring obligation to provide for and protect any children born into the union and see their employment in these terms. This is not the case with cohabitation where equality and competition rather than difference and complementarity rule the day. Marriage has traditionally defined the husband's role as head of the family. So, for example, in 1993, 91% of married individuals defined the husband as the main householder and the person through whom the house is owned or rented. While feminist laws have systematically been eroding the legal effects of marriage, the tradition still remains. Where an opposite-sex couple live together, the, married, the man is counted as the head of household to this day. Research shows that fathers do not need to spend equal time to mothers to be incredibly important to their children. Love, respect and attachment to fathers is created even where fathers spend all day out at work. Thus fathers teach children how to love even in the absence of direct care and attention. In terms of Christian eschatology it might be possible to suggest that it is not just the Christian concept of God the Father teaches the love of the Father, but love of the absent but providing and protecting Father is the first step in teaching the love of God. Finally, I want to look at how marriage is crucial to building identity, and identity is vital to the functioning of any human society or group. Having a clear sense of identity provides a map for action. Our actions will be motivated by a desire to express or preserve our identity. This shapes our actions and goals. When this identity is shared with others, this leads to a sense of belonging and development of community. This enables collective responsibility to achieve collective goals. As groups and communities develop, so do subsets of skills and talents. Each identity group is likely to have its own characteristics, and this becomes a basis for cooperation in the wider world. Think, for example, of the Huguenots. Marriage is crucial to identity because marriage underpins the family, and it is the family which tells us who we are. Eberhardt discusses this in her book, Primal Scream, where she explains, explains how the huge, um, the huge attention given to identity politics is because the family, the prime identity-making institution, has almost irretrievably broken down. She shows how children from intact and divorced families ex exhibit starkly opposed concepts of identity. Children of divorced parents felt like a different person with each of their parents. They felt as if they had two families. The evidence suggested a self torn in two. We develop our identities by knowing our relatives. 
But when so many live in patterns of serial monogamy with shifting sets of family members, this becomes increasingly difficult to do. But marriage doesn't just help us identify our people. Marriage is key to identity because marriage lies at the heart of establishing sex differences. And a fundamental building block of identity is knowing our own sex. The importance of sex differences has been disastrously misunderstood. For the past three generations, we have been laboring under the illusion that any expression of sex differences is the product of discrimination and oppression against women. Consequently, there has been an absolutely persistent effort to erode sex differences and prevent their expression from infancy upwards. This was presciently encapsulated in Monty Python's 1983 film, The Meaning of Life, where the mother asks, following the birth of her baby, a boy or a girl? The doctor replies, I think it's a little early to start imposing roles on it, don't you? Forty years later, that is exactly the world we are living in. Yet knowing whether we are male or female is essential to human development in a number of ways. Visible sex differences or stereotypes play an essential role in helping children develop their awareness of sex constancy. Sex constancy is an understanding that things don't change their essence when they change their appearance, and actually it takes a long time for a child to achieve. But when there is a constant denial that males and females are actually different, that essence is going to be very hard to find. Identity is formed through a process of identification and differentiation. But how can children know whether to identify or differentiate from mothers and fathers and siblings and so on when we are intent on denying all the clues which help us to identify sex? This is where marriage plays such a crucial role. Male and female differences are likely to be more evident in the household than in other settings. This is because the public realm of work has been built on the model of the individual which transcends our sex differences. But because the family, based on marriage, is usually intimately concerned with reproduction, these differences will come to the fore. Marriage has normative patterns which emerge from the different relations which men and women have to reproduction, and marriage will therefore nudge men and women towards sex-based roles. Now, I've outlined why marriage is so important to a healthy society. It helps to transcend the individual and build community. It establishes fatherhood, which is the cornerstone to the family. And it helps us to build our identities by establishing sex differences based on reproductive roles. Why is it that these same effects can't be achieved with cohabitation? With cohabitation, the individual rather than the family remains transcendent. The father is a more peripheral figure and the role stability and role differentiation which we find in marriage doesn't occur in the same way. Marriage is a public commitment shored up by social norms and sanctions. These normative structures and social expectations which may subtly constrain the way married people behave even when our exceptionally permissive divorce laws don't. As a result, marriage provides the security which allows a couple to take risks. It allows individuals to invest in the partnership with less fear of abandonment. Men may be more likely to invest their money in joint purchases, and women may be more likely to invest in the couple's children. If they were not married, he might prioritize private purchases, and she might shore up her security by investing in education. This makes marriage a much more stable relationship. The hard evidence is that whereas 24% of couple parents who are married before having children split up before the child is aged 16, 69% of parents who remain unmarried do so. Most couples who marry stay together, whereas only a minority of unmarried cohabitees do so. And it is the increasing rate of cohabitation which, which explains why fatherless families are on the rise. So we can see why Unwin's findings about monogamy make sense. 
But what about prenuptial chastity? This seems a much harder pill to swallow. Unwin found that pre once prenuptial chastity went, monogamy would fall like a house of cards. This makes sense. If, for example, sex outside marriage is seen as acceptable, the steps to infidelity are much more easily bridged. Where sex outside of marriage is stigmatized, adultery involves breaking the breaking of two significant social taboos. Where sex outside marriage is acceptable, adultery only involves the breaking of one. But it goes further than this. The economist Akerlof showed in his research on contraception and abortion, this was in the 19, I think 19, early 1990s, how once premarital sex was seen as acceptable, out of wedlock births follow close behind. When contraception became widely available, women who made sex freely available set the standard because others felt that when it came to the dating market, they would be left behind. Once sex outside of marriage was seen as acceptable, single parenthood followed and the family started breaking down. It is also worth pointing out that had sex outside marriage never become widely accepted, neither would homosexuality as we see it now have taken root. Where does all of this leave us? I would love to see divorce made more difficult, and I would love to see a married couple's allowance. Married couples should have privileges not accorded to everyone else. But marriage is there to protect us from the state. So state support, so the state can support marriage, but must not intervene in married life. I think there is a return to marriage despite what the state tries to do to our private life. For example, because cohabitation is seen as so normal, those who do choose to get married have an acute sense of res the responsibility involved. And people who were a victim of divorce often seem to make a really concerted effort to stay married themselves. But I do also want to talk about prenuptial chastity. This is something as inconceivable to us as a world without mass media, but that is something we need to change. And interestingly, Unwin found that it only required a portion of society to practice prenuptial continence and monogamy for civilization to take root. Encouragingly, he explained that the group within society which suffers the greatest continence displays the greatest energy and dominates society. I think the tide could start to turn in the direction of prenuptial chastity. Akerlof's research suggested that women gave up on prenuptial chastity when they believed this could lead them to missing out on the dating market. However, as Louise Perry shows in her new book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, all this has changed. It is the women who have made themselves sexually available, who have engaged in hookup culture and other contemporary practices, who are most emotionally confused and devastated as a result. They are also the women men are least likely to choose as their lifelong mates. So we have wisened up since Akalov's day. We need to introduce the concept of prenuptial chastity as something positive to aspire to. Tomorrow belongs to those of us who take these values seriously. And as more and more people realize the value of prenuptial chastity, marriage will become an increasingly desirable, desirable social institution and behaviour will start to change. Thank you very much.